Well, a good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the 2020 Festival of Urbanism. My name's Dallas Rogers, and it's really exciting to have you along this afternoon. I'd like to kick off, of course, by acknowledging and paying respects to the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting this afternoon. For us here in the University of Sydney, that is the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. It's upon their ancestral lands that the University of Sydney is built, but I'd also like to know where you're coming from today. So if you could open up the chat and pop into the chat, the land that you're uh, watching this Zoom meeting on today, that would be great. We are talking about cities and urban life today, and I would like to pay respect to the knowledge embedded forever in the Aboriginal custodianship of country. This session is mobility and housing futures, less, le lessons from COVID-19 and the 2020 bushfires. Um, it's been a year sort of framed by crisis, crisis at the beginning, crisis at the end, and I'm joined by two friends today, uh, Professor David Levinson and Professor Nicole Garan. It's really great to have them along. David joined the School of Civil Engineering at the University of Sydney in 2017 as the Foundation Professor in Transport Engineering. He's written many books, I've got many of them, and his research looks at accessibility, transport economics, transport network evolution, and transport and land use interaction. And we'll be hearing from David in a minute. We're also joined by Professor Nicole Garan. Nicole is the Chair of Urbanism here at the University of Sydney. That means she's my boss. Um, she also leads the Urban Housing Lab at the, at the University of Sydney, and she directs the University's Ahuri Research Centre. Uh, Nicole's research focuses on the intersections between the planning system and the housing systems, and we'll be hearing from Nicole a little bit later on. So I would welcome you to open up the chat, tell us what Aboriginal country you are coming from or you're sitting on today. Drop any questions into the chat as, we'll, as we go, and we'll get to those as we move through the panel discussion this afternoon. But at this point, I would like to hand over to David, who is going to talk to us about mobility futures. Over to you, David. Thank you. So I'm gonna to talk today about the consequences after COVID and what we call the new, new normal. And advanced slide, but. It wouldn't be a great Zoom session without a there technical we go. issue. So, all right, so we want to think about this. When we, we call 20 years ago, we had the Y2K bug. So in 1999, everyone was excited about what was going to happen after the Y2K bug hit and all of our computers would stop working. And so there were huge investments in IT infrastructure, which led to the dot-com bubble. As you can see on the slide, NASDAQ hit a record high that wasn't to be reached again until a couple of years ago. And the consequences of that were that we had an over-expectation at the beginning of the decade about what would happen and then an immediate crash in expectations. And yet we've seen huge changes since then. We've seen the advent of the iPhone. We've seen the introduction of effective social media. We've seen Wikipedia. We've seen Uber, things that didn't exist 20 years ago. And COVID-19 is going to have the same kind of transformation. We're here on Zoom, which is something we wouldn't have done a year ago. So we've got video conferencing from work and from home as being a standard operating procedure for people. We've got virtual conferences and webinars, distance learning, remote medicine, Zoom weddings and funerals. All of these things are important changes to changing how, we're go, how, how our society is operating. And so we can think about change in technology. And there's a famous quote from Ernest Hemingway, how did you go bankrupt? Two ways, gradually, then suddenly. Well, how does technology change occur? It occurs gradually, then suddenly. These aren't things that we didn't know about 20 years ago. In 2000, we were looking at CUC Me, for instance, which was a internet video chatting program. Um, I tested this with my wife when I was first in Minnesota. She was in, still in California. 
and we could have a internet com connection, but frankly, her voice sounded like she was a, a very good radio announcer, but a male radio announcer, because there was a huge amount of distortion. The technology wasn't ready yet, but we've been playing with this for decades. Now, the idea of gradually then suddenly has returned the home to what are, many of the functions it used to have 200 years ago when we, when we lived in um, agricultural settings where the home was a restaurant, it was the workplace, it was the schoolhouse, it was the theater. This has become important again, as we've seen with lockdown. So we find that jobs that can be done at home, certainly not everything, but 37% of all jobs in the US, 39% in Australia can be done at home. And when we look at that spatially, we see that it's a much greater share of those that are in metropolitan areas than in rural areas and a much greater st share still of those in the central business district. And so we should expect spatial effects from um, this. So even if we've only got 39% of jobs that can be done full-time at home, many more can be done part-time at home. Um, and if we think about what are the consequences, well, we don't need um, the CBD as much as we used to. And governments and universities might discover they don't need real estate in particular locations as much as they used to. Consequence of that is people will start moving out in terms of firms no longer paying for expensive real estate. Um, we're also seeing that people um, don't need to necessarily go to restaurants if they can have food delivered. We're gonna start seeing Advent, and we already see the beginnings of this in terms of dark or ghost kitchens, food that can be delivered to your home, but restaurants that don't actually serve customers at the place of um, where the food is cooked. So we conducted a study during the Sydney lockdown um, back in April and asked how many people missed their commute. Um, and it turns out 51% of the people said they missed this time little or not at all. It varies by mode. Um, and people who took public transit, um, if they had multiple transfers, they especially didn't miss their commute because it's especially inconvenient and especially long. But people who were driving didn't miss their commute nearly as much as people um, who were walking or, or riding bikes, people who actually enjoyed what they were doing. So as we move away from this idea of people having to commute to the CBD, people having to commute by public transit because that's the only way to effectively get to the CBD, we're looking at a new pattern. And so the question becomes, if historically we've needed CBDs for in-person contact to get these kinds of economies of agglomeration that made cities valuable um, because we couldn't communicate electronically, what happens now that we can effectively communicate electronically? Um, do we need to always have in-person contact in order to um, enable innovation and enable exchange of knowledge? And so we go back 200 years and, and longer before the Industrial Revolution. Um, we didn't have these kinds of large cities um, because economies of agglomeration were outweighed by the diseconomies. And obviously, COVID and viruses are diseconomies. But we now see that there's other kinds of ways of meeting the, the, the services that cities provided. So clearly cities aren't gonna be abandoned overnight. Um, it takes decades, if not centuries, to urbanize, and all of that real estate will still be there. It's not going to go to a value of zero. Um, you can see on the graph the growth in urbanization in China. But perhaps we're reaching peak city, and particularly peak CBD. So the percentage of people who are going to live in cities um, may have reached a peak, now because we have effective substitutes for interacting online that can replace the in-person interaction that we've, long, um, that we've long had. So the question really is about what we might call the explore-exploit trade-off. So we think about people who are, you know, the, the idea of the triumph of the city that Ed Glazer put forward a few years ago. Um, the argument was that new ideas emerge from in-person interaction, okay? And so while we have a set of ideas and we can go home and work on those ideas, if we want to get new ideas, then we really need to, to interact. Cities have been described as ideas having sex. Um, but the question, question now arises, well, if we can get this idea exchange online, if we can get it through a lot of shallower transactions, but so many more of them that we can do online than we could do with the deeper, but in person, but few 
interactions that we had in person, can we, we replace this exploration of new ideas and come up with a, an effective alternative? So I'm not convinced that cities are needed to the degree they once were, and that since we have so many of these interactions now, we can, we can generate ideas online. And we've been doing this for 25, 30 years pretty clearly in the, in the internet community. Um, and I'll just point as an example, the journal Findings, uh, which we launched in 2018 um, as transport findings. And the idea was simply, we should have a way for academics to be able to publish short articles quickly um, that are focused and to the point. And this is an idea that I just sort of threw out there on Twitter and a bunch of people said, yeah, that's a great idea. We formed everything online. We've done everything online. We've had a couple of meetups at conferences, but we've really generated the whole idea electronically. I think there's a lot of things like that. Now, it's not all going to be through Zoom meetings. Zoom isn't, the, isn't going to be the paragon of our future in-person on, in online interactions. There's other tools that are being developed. Um, message boards, which we've had for decades, but you know, are getting better and getting more focused. Online interactive meeting boards, Miro is an example, and, and so on. So the, the question then is, if there's more to be done at home, instead of in the office, what are we gonna do with our houses? And we're gonna remodel our houses, make them bigger, put in in-home offices. And this is a trend that's been going on for decades now. Um, and this is an example from the US in terms of square footage per person um, in US homes between 1975 and 2015, rising from 1,600 to over um, to nearly 2,800 square feet. Okay? This is a huge increase in house size. Um, we already have in-home offices for a lot of people in the United States and Australia um, and some other countries, uh, and we would expect more so. And so people who don't have them now but will be expected to work at home may remodel their homes or relocate. Okay. So we might think about having in-home offices for every member of the household. Um, now, if you want a large house, where are you going to do that? You're going to do that where land is cheap because if you're not commuting to the office every day, you don't need to pay a premium for in-city urban land. And this drives development to exurban, the exurban realm. So um, people be living in small towns, people be living out at the urban fringe. And while there's already been a lot of that, this just pushes the trend even further. So how do we build our good suburbs? How do we engage in um, meaningful out-of-home activity that's not at work? How do we socialize with people that's not around the office water cooler? So I think these are all important questions that we really need to think about when we're doing um, designs of new cities. So we already see that um, public transit ridership is down. Um, this is US uh, vehicle miles traveled, significantly down during the peak of COVID earlier this year. Um, it rose back to within 10% of its uh, previous last year um, normal total. Um, obviously, it's going to go down again as the U.S. Re reaches a second COVID peak. But the question of whether public transit ever returns to the pre-virus normal, I think that's still an open question. Um, the, the usage patterns that we've seen in cities around the world um, are that people are avoiding public transit. And they're replacing it with working from home dominantly, but also with things like bicycles and um, uh, walking to work if they still live in an urban area. And of course, a little bit of substitution for driving, but the main reason they're using public transit is because driving is extremely expensive. Daily parking is, is a major problem. So this is gonna be something that we're gonna continue to, to need to think about. So places like Sydney um, and other major cities have started to build pop-up bikeways. This is an example. Um, but they haven't done it rapidly enough to make biking an effective alternative yet. But we can already see that biking is picking up as, in, as a replacement for public transit. And how much of that's temporary for people who are still going to want to work in the CBD and how much of it's going to be replaced by people working from home um, full-time or four times a week or three times a week is still, still an open question. So if we're going to interact primarily intermediated by the internet, um, we're moving to basically a new stage of development and what we might think of as spaceless places. 
right? A play, no physical location to where we are. We're all just in the cloud. And then we're going to have all of these former places that we developed, um, abandoned warehouses, abandoned office buildings, abandoned um, urban environments that are going to have to get reconfigured. And we might think about more apartments within cities, um, more housing within cities. And now we'll, we'll then have these placeless spaces of abandoned landscapes of things that are no longer fit for purpose. Just as we went through in the uh, post-industrial period, as we were transforming from an industrial to um, a post-industrial office-based era. Now we're transforming from an office to a work-from-home-based era, and we're going to have this post-post-industrial types. So with that, I'll stop. Um, I think I've met my time budget, and thank you. Thanks so much for that, David. Uh, really interesting. I um, took some notes here um, that I want to take into the conversation with Nicole in a minute. So. Uh, I like this idea of peak CBD. I think that's really interesting. Something I'd never heard before was cities are ideas having sex. Did I hear that right? You did. Yeah. Um, it's not my quote originally, yeah. so I put. Yeah. I like it. I think we'll steal it. Uh, could become a theme for the festival of urbanism. I think um, new types of houses, and I think new types of houses, new types of urban spaces we're seeing come out of the pandemic, and this idea of post office, a city that's post office, I think is quite interesting. And of course, that's connected to what are our houses. So uh, thanks so much for that. Um, do we want to take some questions now? Or do we want to jump straight into the discussion with Nicole? Okay, we might um, jump into the discussion with Nicole now. So uh, if everybody gives a virtual round of applause for David. Um, thanks. And we're swapping. Yeah, I think you're just swapping seats. And now I'm um, very lucky to be joined by Professor Nicole Garan, and we're going to have a chat about what the two crises mean, so the fires and, and COVID-19 mean for housing. And I guess the first place to start with this discussion is really what role has the house played in kind of managing? I'm thinking particularly about COVID-19. It seems to me to be quite an important piece of social infrastructure in our cities. What role has the house played in dealing with the pandemic? Yeah, absolutely, Dallas. I mean, for all of us, the home has been the place where we've experienced COVID-19. There's been a lot of focus, and rightly so, on working from home, and 31% of us, according to the ABS, actually did work from home, which perhaps is a little bit smaller than we might think, particularly knowledge workers, but it's also all of the things that we did at home that we don't, you know, necessarily do all of the time because we're on lockdown, like more housework, according to the ABS, but also gardening, baking, spending time with pets. Of course, those are things that we can do depending on the kind of home that we live in. We've also spent more time in our neighbourhoods and we've learned through that process the importance of access to open space and you know um, parks unfortunately also very unevenly supplied across the city and we know that low-income people for instance are off, have often got less access to um, neighborhood open space so the pandemic has really revealed the inequalities when it comes to access to good housing and when it comes to the locations of our homes as well mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you about what we've learned in a little more detail. And I think you um, make two interesting points. One's about the kind of design of our home and the design of our neighbourhood. And the other one is about the downside of bad design and the health effects. Let's start with good house design and good neighbourhood design. Why are they so important? Yeah, I mean... Anyone who spent the winter during COVID-19 working or baking um, will have had a jump in their power bill. For some people, that was you know, a lot worse than others. So obviously, thermal comfort, energy efficiency, those types of things are critically important. We know um, internationally from the research in from the United States that think that poor housing conditions tangibly increase the risk of infection. So overcrowded housing, for instance, has always been a public health risk, but it's even more of a risk in the context of COVID-19, but also the effects of things like loneliness, depression, social isolation, all of those types of things are linked to inadequate housing. 
and we know um, from recent research and of course the ongoing um, figures from the ABS that in cities like Sydney and Melbourne, overcrowding has become a major health risk in, in Sydney. 33,000 households are severely overcrowded and many of our frontline workers actually, people who've been out there every day, um, our health workers for instance, are living in overcrowded housing in particular. So all of those sort of, those problems in our housing system have, have come home to roost in the context of the pandemic. Mm. What about those people who are, I think you were touching on this just then about precariousness in the private rental sector. Mm. How does the how does that play out? And I think that's connected to employment and people losing their jobs as well. Yeah, I mean, there's been, you know, we knew before that we had a looming issue in the private rental sector, but the pandemic really brought that home. And we saw in the, um, well, we've got more than 30% of Australian households now, nearly 30% in the private rental sector. And that is that meant great precarity and governments, the Commonwealth and the state governments needing to act very quickly to announce rental moratoria so that we didn't see widespread mass evictions and also to introduce income support so that people could continue to pay their rents. And that really reflects the precarity of a, of a disorganised sector that's comprised of mum and dad landlords who themselves say that they are in a financially precarious position. Mm. And 60% of private landlords announce a net loss every year. And so this is a very shaky basis on which to house you know, nearly a third of Australian households. Mm. Would you say that then COVID-19 provides a bit of a window into what our housing system is and some of those dynamics? Yeah, absolutely. And it's, you know, been, I mean, we've said before the pandemic, of course, that it's a situation that was not fit for purpose, but we've, it's also shown us some of the things that can actually work. So it showed that if you provide decent, if you increase the income of people on very low incomes, that they're actually able to improve their housing circumstances. And so research by Uhuri and also research by the ABS found that low income earners have actually been able to, in many situations, access better housing and improve their rental housing because of um, income support. Mm. We learned things like that, for instance. We've learned that if you provide street sleepers with a place to sleep. I wanted to ask uh, you about homelessness yeah. because it was, it seemed to be an intractable problem that we couldn't deal with around the world. But all of a sudden when we needed to get homeless people off the streets for health reasons, we very quickly found solutions. What does that tell us about that type of problem. Yeah, we, I mean, we think this about housing. We're told that housing is too complex a policy problem to deal with. Well, it's clearly not. Governments all around Australia and indeed internationally move very quickly to accommodate rough sleepers. In Australia, around 8,000 rough sleepers have been, were accommodated during the height of the um, first lockdowns, according to Uhuri research. And where that's been followed up with support and an ongoing housing option, those people have been able to be housed. Unfortunately, it looks as though that support's been temporary. Yeah. What about, you've done a lot of work on Airbnb and temporary accommodation. What's happened to, and a lot of that is, a lot of that market is on the back of international and domestic travel and that's been shut down. What's the kind of Airbnb landscape sort of in COVID and where's that going? Yeah, I mean, of course, there's a difference between the cities and the regional areas, but in terms of Sydney and Melbourne, COVID-19 was kind of the perfect experiment for what happens if you release houses back into the permanent rental market. Mm. And the RBA estimates that about 1% of, of the vacancy rate, which is quite a significant amount, has the increased vacancy rates in Sydney and Melbourne are directly attributable to um, short-term rentals going back to the long-term housing market. Mm -hmm. And what about where do you think that's going when we come out, well, if we come out of COVID, if there is a post-COVID, if there is an after, <laughs> what does it look like for short-term rentals? Well, Australia's probably got the most generous in terms of the loosest regulations of the short-term rental sector of any country that I'm aware of. And so, you know, it's not going to be a long-term, um, there's no long-term restrictions against that um, housing stock. So it's going to, presumably it will, 
feed the voracious um, appetite of international yeah. tourists for, um, for affordable, flexible rental accommodation, but our permanent renters will be mm. back, to, um, back to ground zero, unfortunately. I know you never like to speculate, but I wonder if I could ask you to, just for a second, what do you think um, those who rent out, say Airbnb dwellings, what do you think they'll take forward as kind of lessons for particularly the ones that have businesses around having multiple Airbnb dwellings? Look, I think we need to learn more about what that looks like in Sydney and Melbourne. Mm. It's probably quite different to the regional areas where there's long been a holiday home sort of infrastructure and where operators right now are probably enjoying a tourist boom actually mm. because of domestic tourism. But in, in Sydney and Melbourne, I think landlords might very well can reconsider actually having multiple properties mm. um, on the short term rental market, but we'll have to wait and see. I think, I hope state governments seize the opportunity and actually decide that our permanent, that our housing stock really should primarily be used for permanent um, accommodation rather than for the tourist sector. Yep. Let's uh, look a little bit towards the future here. And we have had a whole bunch of uh, policies that have injected a bit of money into the rental sector, so JobKeeper, et cetera. Uh, people are talking about a fiscal cliff that we might fall off. What does this mean? And combine that with an already stressed rental sector before we went into COVID, what does the kind of private rental sector look like coming out of this crisis? Yeah, it's really alarming. I mean, internationally, there are calls for all states to take action because Australia wasn't alone in A, providing income support, but B, introducing rental protections. And globally, there is a call for governments to make those protections permanent. And I think we need to do things in New South Wales, for instance, and in the other states to prevent no fault evictions, for instance, and also to improve the quality of the private rental sector. And that's going to mean rental standards as well as enforcing those standards. And we clearly need to increase income support or at the very least private um, rental support, mm -hmm. such as the Commonwealth Rental Assistance Payment. Are you uh, optimistic about those things occurring? Look, Do you think this has been enough of a jolt to make those types of changes? That was the optimism, wasn't it? And, mm. and I mean, if we take ourselves back to February and the end of the bushfires and this real sense that, you know, 3,100 houses destroyed in the bushfires, an obvious need to act on climate change, for instance, we're going to build back better, we're going to see some leadership in that policy arena, which so far we haven't seen. Then with um, COVID-19, so obviously revealing that just profound failures of our housing system. The hope is that this crisis would force a real change. Now, so far, what we've had is the home builder scheme, the Commonwealth Government's home builder scheme, which is $25,000, quite a generous scheme, really if you are making a major renovation to your home and if you're in the market and able to take out a home loan up to $750,000, you know, it's quite a sizable um, chunk for your deposit. But we've seen, in fact, the Commonwealth Government implying that it's actually not in the business of housing assistance anymore, which is puzzling. Mm. Uh, it's puzzling everyone, quite frankly, but it's certainly inconsistent with the way that the Commonwealth has taken leadership in the past in, in the wake of crises like the global financial crisis and, of course, the post-World War when social housing was the way that you build a country and mm. certainly, um, you know, build economic stability and, and social um, of the social benefits of that as well. So, so far it's been disappointing. We have seen a significant announcement by the Victorian government yesterday in New South Wales, um, you know, this is virtually business as usual really is how I would characterise the housing announcements there. 
we've uh, seen a bit of talk, uh, mainly from real estate agents, talking about a lot of interest in the rural centres. So people giving up on the cities um, and moving to rural centres. What do you, what's the sort of data on this? Do we have any yet that comes out of COVID? Yeah. I know you've done some research prior to COVID looking at this mm. as well. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's tantalising. And I mean, the picture that David painted for us is, is, is an exciting one because one of the problems in our, in our housing system has been that people have needed to live so close to employment centres in order to yeah, access work. But the short term picture we have seen, and certainly the ABS has um, published some, um, some data late last month showing that more people left Sydney and Melbourne, for instance, than came in. And of course, that's due to the lack of international arrivals in Sydney, really. We've always had a steady exodus of Sydney siders for the regions or for the other states. In Melbourne, it's, an, an, it's a new trend, but we'll, we'll see whether that trend is going to continue. So it's a little early to know, but one of the one of the binds that we're going to find ourselves in very quickly is that the housing markets in regional Australia actually are incredibly stressed as well. So rental vacancy rates, for instance, in the central coast have halved compared to last mm. year to a minuscule, I think it's 1.4%. The Illawarra central coast is even lower than that, less than 1% at the moment. So unfortunately, the idea of a sort of regional exodus, while I think that would be a very good thing for Australia's geography mm -hmm. to rebalance economic activity and the distribution of our population, we've still got to fix our housing system and our housing policy to make that work. Mm -hmm. Why do people leave cities? Is it pressures inside the city like housing affordability or is it what the regions offer? Or is it a combination of those things? Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting question. I mean, certainly it depends on, there's a combination of push and pull factors. So the push factors are affordability. There are also things like housing choice in terms of that, that trade-off that people make between the space and amenity in their homes and proximity to the city, which as David has said, um, the proximity argument may, may go away and so people will be moving to a better quality home in the backyard, etc. People move for tenure because they want to own their own home. Mm -hmm. But the main push factors are economic. It's too expensive. Now, the pull factors are, of course, work, and we haven't had those pull factors in regional Australia because most of the jobs have been in Sydney and Melbourne. Um, but they're also often uh, family, you know, so you see a chain migration, the grandparents go first and then the, the, uh, the children, the grown up children with their own um, children often follow. And so lifestyle is, has very much been a pull factor for people who are retiring or near retirement and that can trigger a chain reaction. The cultural geographers say that, for instance, artists and entrepreneurs, startup firms may also lead a, um, a, a migration, a, a renaissance, if you like, to regional Australia, although to date that's been quite small. Mm -hmm. and I guess we need things like telecommunications infrastructure and other things in the regional centres to make that stuff work, yeah, which absolutely. taps into what uh, David was talking about mm -hmm. before. If our cities, if we are moving post office and if our cities look very different, what is the future of high rise and density? We've had a, quite a push for density done well over the last decade, decade or so. Um, if people move out of the cities, if people don't need to be as close to work, what does that mean for the density question? Yeah, I think it's, it's really too soon to make a call on that question around density. But there are a couple of things that we can certainly say. And one is that good design is what matters the most. And so the push to erode the apartment design standards, for instance, if that ever gained momentum, I'd be one of the people saying, no, no, good apartment design is critical, which is a theme that's coming up throughout this festival. But we know that sort of mixed, walkable, compact communities, whether they're in the centre of Sydney or whether they're, you know, in the centre of a regional area like Albury or Orange um, or, you know, Geelong for that matter, we know that compactness, walkability, fine-grained uses, which actually do feed off a critical mass of people, 
we know that those are wonderful places to live. And I think when we look at our central cities in Australia, the inner cores actually are often blessed by natural amenities and cultural amenities as well. So I think there will always be a future for density, but it won't be at the expense of everything else. So density with good design, compactness, I think will, will still be the type of place that people will want to live in in the future. And what should we do about all of these challenges and even some of the innovations that we've trialled so far? What, what sort of housing policy future do you see? Or do we need? We've been focusing probably the last four decades on this idea that all we need to do is build more houses. And that's been particularly so in Australia. I think the refrain has started to pick up in other countries as well, and I can't speak for those other countries. But in Australia, talking about this idea of housing shortage as though that was the only crisis that we had has made us blind to the idea that we need to look not so much at the quantity of new houses, although that's really important, that becomes very abstract. And most recently, people have talked about the quantity of houses as though that's critical for the housing industry and for the economy. Well, yes, it is. But the much more important thing is about homes that people are able to afford and that meet their needs. And so I think we need to have a, a really big reorientation in the way that we think about our housing policy. And it's a way for a little bit from this idea of housing as investment and as something that we need to prop up in a market in a market sense and recenter the idea of home as the start of housing policy. And if we do that, that allows us then to say with our limited resources, with our limited public resources, that our investments in housing should be prioritising low income earners and low income renters. And so that allows us to say that whatever stimulus, whatever budgetary measures we're doing, we're going to invest those in social and affordable housing. And of course, in the retrofit of our existing housing stock to make it more climate resilient. Again, starting with our low income housing stock, it allows us to say that we need decent income support for low income renters. You know, it allows us to prioritise good quality housing standards rather than only the quantity of, um, of new dwelling approvals, for instance. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thanks for that, Nicole. And I think we might open up the discussion a little more and bring David back in now. And we might, if you're in Zoom land, please open up the chat function and start asking us some questions. We'll get to those uh, for sure. Um, but David, I might ask you, just reflecting on your um, talk to start with and what we've just heard from Nicole. It seems there's very much an intersection between home, mobility and employment. What do you make of that kind of nexus? Well, I mean, that's sort of been the center of urban economics for the last 60 years. You know, I mean, the, this idea of people are selecting their homes or making a trade off between um, space and proximity to the job. But now if the proximity to the job is broken, at least for some of the population, then you can get whatever home you want as long as you've got virtual access to it. And I think that's a huge change in how we, how we organize space and how we organize metropolitan areas and cities. Mm -hmm. So the, the question is the extent to which people are satisfied working from home five days a week or is it three days a week or two days a week, because I mean, all of those are gonna have different consequences. And obviously not everyone can work from home. You know, there's a certain amount of physicality in a lot of types of jobs that people have. Um, but that's steadily increasing. I mean, you know, I think as a share of the workforce, it's, it's growing to be larger and larger, just as agriculture, which used to be 90% of the workforce is now in the U.S., you know, under 3% of the workforce. We'll see, and we see knowledge workers increasing. So I think that share is just going to go up over time. Mm -hmm. We've got some great questions coming through on the chat function. So what role do big projects like WestConnects have in a post-COVID world? I think that's a great question. So um, WestConnects is, it, 
in for those of you not in Sydney, is a major t highway tunnel that is built from the western suburbs to closer to the Sydney CBD. Um, is highly controversial, um, and the fact that it provides um, a piece of infrastructure that can be used in different ways, I think, is important. Now, right now, it's being planned as um, something for automobiles primarily, but there's still some need. There's, I mean, there's still going to be some center, even if the center isn't as strong as it used to be, and there's still some need to get there. So we still have to have freight systems and people moving systems. And so the fact that the demand in the Sydney CBD is going to go down doesn't mean it's going to go to zero. So once that infrastructure exists, it'll get exploited. And just as the housing stock, right? Once the houses aren't going to be abandoned, they're just going to fall in price relative to houses elsewhere. So we're not going to not use West Connects just because the Sydney CBD isn't as important. Mm -hmm. I'll ask you the same question that I asked Nicole, and that's, do you think the government will rethink some of these projects post COVID? Do we, do we learn something from the COVID moment about what we fund and how we fund it and what we build? Or do you think we revert back to sort of pre COVID days? Like will we build another West Connects um, if, if it were, if we were funding that today? You, Okay, what I would hope the government learns, I guess, is sort of my first answer to that question. Now, whether the government will learn, governments are slow, slow to learn things as we've learned through history, um, and there's sort of the always fighting the last war problem. Um, and congestion is, is always used as a battle cry in these things, and, and the buzzword of busting congestion and gang changer, and all of those kinds of things that the government says about these road projects. Um, it's something that people who are driving yeah, sure, if we had an extra lane and nothing else in the world changed, then I would have less congestion on this particular segment, is going to be convincing to a lot of people. And as the, as the share of people driving might increase, right? I mean, so one of the consequences of CBD becomes less important is um, people will still continue to travel for all sorts of purposes, maybe not for the commute to work to the CBD, but that's going to affect public transit more than it's going to affect the automobile. Um, there's still going to be demand for these kinds of projects. I think there's smarter ways of addressing that demand with things like road pricing and so on, and um, that slowly the government is picking up on. It was um, interesting news out of South Australia before. Um, the more interesting news of the COVID spike was that they were going to be implementing a pricing chart, a price on electric vehicles, a per kilometer charge on electric vehicles, which you could say, well, that's going to discourage electric vehicles. And if you were to take that money and subsidize the electric vehicles, it, that, that would be a better way of dealing with it than just putting that money into general revenue. But the idea of charging for electric vehicles when in 10 years it's going to be all new vehicles, in 20 years all vehicles are going to be electric vehicles, gives the government a direct way of influencing travel demand. And New South Wales was talking about something similar over the next year. So the idea of implementing road pricing um, which is something that us transport economists have been talking about for decades. Um, I did my dissertation on that topic even 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago. That this is something that might be finally peeking through to become reality, and then we can start managing peak demands rather than building infrastructure. I think that's really the way we need to think about this. Um, but does the government learn this? The government will eventually learn this, but it's going to be a very slow transition. Mm. We'll shift gears a little bit. We're getting quite a few questions around uh, skyscrapers, tall buildings, vertical infrastructure. And I've been talking to developers and they're quite interested in what might happen to the CBD, both in terms of residential real estate and, and particularly commercial real estate. What sort of offices will we have in the future? Nicole, I might throw this one to, one to you. Do you have any thoughts about if we do go to a city where more people are working from home or even people are working from home a little more, what will this mean for questions around the way we design our homes? And will we see kind of a reconfiguration of high rise um, residential and commercial stock in the city? Mm. I think that's actually been underway. And so I'd hate to call what's going to happen with the commercial office um, sector you know I certainly wouldn't call I think it's been very interesting though that we've seen companies like Atlassant I think it is still pursue their 
major investments. So I do think that there will continue to be a place for firms and their employees to come together for particular purposes. I think what, if um, David's sort of vision comes true, for me what liberates us is actually the journey to work as being the major structural thing that we use to organise city planning and also to organise housing choice. So once we start to think about other types of trips, then the neighbourhood becomes much more important and being able to fulfil, you know, your social needs, you know, get your food locally, have your school locally, have, you know, those types of your recreation in the local area, that becomes much more important. As to housing design, look, we have had a trend in Australia to bigger homes, um, on the fringe that's been happening but again this is the the more urgent question I think in relation to housing design is who has access to you know to decent housing at all and I think we've got to fix that problem before we worry about you know are our houses adaptable to offices you know, perhaps they are perhaps they aren't but having spaces to work near homes as part of our neighbourhood precinct planning, I think is probably a good idea. So we'll probably start to just see more mixed use occurring. We're going to need to do that quite carefully though. Mm. David, I've got a bit of a self-interested question. I'm a cyclist, I ride to work every day, and I've been quite happy with the pop-up cycleways, and I've been quite happy with seeing the kind of reclaiming of some of that space. What do you think the longevity of something like that is, both in terms of the physical infrastructure, but also the kind of change of behavior? Yeah, I think the pop-up cycleways that we've seen are probably will stick around. And there've been some pushes to deploy the, the long-term cycle plan in places like Sydney much more rapidly than the current, whatever it is, 25 year deployment cycle for this. And technically, it's very simple to do. Um, the pop-up cycleways took longer than they should have in Sydney, but if you look at how other cities have done it, it has literally been overnight rather than over a few weeks that you can lay out a new lane and you can reconfigure the lanes on the existing pavement. And people get used to that. And it turns out that it wasn't the worst thing in the world. And people will park half a block away instead of in front of their houses if they wind up with a a cycleway in front of their house, or they'll park on their own property rather than on the street in front. There are solutions to these problems, and I'm, again, sort of, I, I hope that people will see that, that this is easier and easier to do, and I think the more people who are bicycling, the more pop-up cycleways will get demanded and will get built, and the more cycleways that get built, the more people will, will be cycling. There's this positive feedback loop that takes place, and this might be the sort of the shock to the system that, that helped encourage it, but, I mean, Sydney is a very far away from being Amsterdam or Copenhagen, and so... Um, getting from here to there is a long struggle. Yeah. Um, we have a question in the chat. Uh, my friend that was in a very crowded household moved into their own one bedroom place during COVID. It was life changing for them. So the question is, do we need these types of income like job seeker to kind of prop up our housing markets and to make our housing systems work? Well, yes, <laughs> quite obviously. And, um, you know, it, this is one of those cases where you, we've got the evidence now. You know, it, you didn't need to deprive people of decent incomes and then give it to them for a short-term period in the midst of a global health crisis to know that it would actually work. People would be able to access decent housing if they had sufficient funds to do so. But we have that evidence now. And we also have the evidence that if you give people that income support, they use it on their rent, mm. you know, and that's really important to know as well. So yes, I think we do need a permanent increase to job uh, keeper payments and we also need to look at private rental um, support as well. Uh, the alternative of course is a massive injection in the social housing stock and we should do that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I think another question for you Nicole, it's got Airbnb on it so I think that definitely is you um, and it's a question about limiting how long you can rent Airbnb in the city of Sydney to six months. Okay, thank you for that question. So the New South Wales planning law limits in Sydney, 
the number of nights that you can rent an Airbnb for an, it's 180, 182, something like that, roughly half a year. They don't say that um, that can be non-consecutively. So, you know, you could rent them every weekend, for instance, and you might, in fact, make more money than you would renting to a local. So I don't see that control actually as a control that preserves housing. But don't take my word for it. The Reserve Bank has said that when the tourists go, the landlords put the property back on the private rental market. So we know that whatever controls we had in place on short-term rentals before um, COVID weren't preserving our housing units for housing. If I could just sure, yeah, jump so in. When I, when I first moved to Sydney a few years ago, um, first three months I lived in an Airbnb. Um, it was great. And, you know, the landlady lived there as well. So it wasn't, it was sort of a, the original intent of Airbnb as opposed to this, it just becomes an apartment for people. Um, and I think that this is a, a good alternative and there's no reason that Airbnb can't be used effectively for long, you know, longer term housing and not just sort of the one weekend or for the tourists, but as a way of people truly renting out the spare bedroom and this being the marketplace for doing that. Um, so we should be more flexible and this is a way of bringing more housing supply onto the market that previously would have been trapped because there was no way to effectively rent out the spare room to people who were moving into the town or, or something like that. I think so think about it more openly than yep it looks like Nicole wants her we're reply. very that open one. to that there are absolutely no restrictions against people renting a spare bedroom or you know renting their home while they go away on holidays that's unrestricted you know go for your life and there's good reasons for doing that as yeah. you say David so but um strangely despite the sort of the the marketing which would actually make you believe that Airbnb really is about you know with staying in someone's spare room or, you know, yeah. maybe even their backyard granny flat while the main people live in the main residence. In actual fact, it's only a very small proportion of the nights that are used in Airbnb properties that are, you know, people doing rooms and, and spare rooms. And I think it's less than 30%, for instance, of Sydney's Airbnb listings are in that category, a room in someone's house. Yeah. And of course, we had um, Caitlin Buckle talking just earlier today at the festival about the reuse of um, some of the short-term rental mm -hmm. stock for um, key workers during related to these uh, two crises as well. Uh, David, we have a question for you about um, connections between uh, the city and and rural centres. And um, what what should we do to enhance um, the mo those movements? So I mean, there's already technologies available for people to move from one place to another. I mean, they can use an automobile. Um, we have slow speed train between our regional centers in the big cities. Um, we have air air travel between um, small towns with airports and the larger cities. And so then the question is, what kind of investments would you want to make? You could upgrade highways, which is going to be the thing that probably affects a lot of people because most of the regional centers are never going to be on a high-speed train line. Um, there, have, of course, been discussions for decades about very fast trains connecting Sydney and Melbourne and, of course, some of the towns along the way. And if that were to ever happen, that would improve access to those cities, but that's a small number of regional centers overall. So I guess the question is, you know, what kind of access improvements can we make? And the answer is probably for most people going to be automobile based. And you know, upgrading roads is one way of doing that. But I think over the next couple of decades, as we think about what's going on, we're really upgrading the vehicles themselves. We're moving into a world where we're gonna have autonomous vehicles and electric vehicles and electric vehicles sooner. Um, meaning that people can enter a vehicle and not have to worry about driving and it will be much safer and that is a huge improvement in the connectivity between a smaller city that might be five hours away from a major center or eight hours away allows people to do other things or sleep while the car is driving now this is a not something that's going to happen tomorrow but it's something that is going to be happening in a decade and two 
that which is the same time frame it would take to build any kind of major infrastructure project. So you think it's more probably autonomous vehicles than high speed rail? I, you might there might be construction of high speed rail between Sydney and Melbourne, um, but that's not going to affect most of the regional centers. So in terms of actually getting people moving between the the regions and the cities, it's going to be automobile based or um, if you look to the second half of this century, perhaps even uh, multi-copter or helicopter based of some kind or another, but I don't think that's ready for prime time quite yet. <laughs> uh, I might ask you, Nicole, about mm -hmm. this one. You've done a lot of work in the regions too. What do you think we need to do to kind of facilitate the move to the regional centers? Yeah, I mean, actually, I think movement within regional centres, so within the cities themselves and between the small regional centres, actually a sort of network, a regional network is the way to think about things. And there, it might not be private vehicle actually. Bus transport, for instance, minibuses can be really good in regional areas. They tend to be really poorly serviced at the moment. But, um, you know, having grown up in a regional area, I can tell you that having a decent public transport system would be transformative literally um, and of course walking and cycling infrastructure ironically is something that the planners seem to forget in much of, of, of regional Australia so I think there I think we can think about regional centres a little bit about the way in the same way that we think about the inner city villages you know walkable places but then we look at the connections between them and then the questions the big trips that you might need to make between a centre and the region, you know, I'm agnostic as to the transport mode there because hopefully it doesn't need to be that frequent. You know, if we're actually able to catalyse regional economies, then people will be moving more locally. Yeah. I'm just going to flag Tehran Alizahi and say we also need telecommunications infrastructure out there as well. We're coming very close to the end of this session, so I thought we could wrap up with some key takeaways from both of you. So either big visions for the future or key policies we need to change or key interventions for this moment. Might start with you, David. What's a kind of key takeaway for this panel Well, discussion? I think we're, we haven't really accounted for information technology in the way we do spatial planning. And we've known this, is, this change has been coming for decades. Um, and we've had forecasts about it. And we've seen steady uptake of work from home, not at the rapid rate that we've seen in the last year, but it's been steadily increasing. We've certainly seen steady increases in things like teleshopping and you know online buying things from Amazon and the equivalent. Um, and you look at 40 year plans and they don't account for any technology change at all. And I think that's really strange It's it's just, business as usual from a technology perspective. And I think we really need to get planners much more comfortable with the idea of how we have technology shifts and how those might influence um, other aspects of society. We've seen it over the last few centuries as we move from walking to streetcars and streetcars to automobiles. Um, and we're moving from automobiles to a very different kind of automobile over the next 30, 40 years. And we pretend that this doesn't make any other kinds of changes. And I think that's, that's the largest problem that we have right now in our, our planning schools. Excellent. Look, David's talks have shown us how quickly things can change without us even knowing. And so I'm going to throw out a piece of, I don't know, hope punk that we don't give up <laughs> on housing policy or on the potential that we could see a big change in our housing system. So it may be that that change is going to need to be pushed you know, by people, not accepting what's just been an absolutely dysfunctional, unfair housing system. But I'm gonna say, let's put homes at the centre of housing policy and let's ask for a more aspirational and a decent housing policy and system as well. Excellent. And uh, that's it for this session. I hope that you've enjoyed it. Uh, if you could all give a virtual round of applause for our two great panelists today. I'm Dallas Rogers. See you next time.